Hello and welcome to Tech Deals CPU performance comparison on four different computers. We are testing two old and two new processors today the AMD FX 8300, the AMD Ryzen 5 1600X, the Intel i7 2600K, and the i7 7700K. Please note that the clock speeds you see on the screen are overclocked clock speeds. They are fixed. There is no turbo, there is no variability, so each of the processors is running constant at those speeds. The two older systems have DDR3-1600 and the two newer systems have DDR4-3200 MHz memory. All four computers have 16 gigs of system RAM installed, an AMD RX 488GB graphics card, 1080p resolution, and you can see the detail settings there on the screen, which will vary from game to game. Fraps was used for the game performance numbers you'll see at the end of this video, but it was not used to record the video you're going to watch. Instead, AMD's Relive software is used to record the gameplay. Very, very small performance penalty, at most 5%. So if you are streaming or recording your gameplay, this is exactly what you should expect to see. If you are not, add about 5% to the final numbers. The numbers in green at the top left corner of the screen are from MSI Afterburner, a free program you can download and run on virtually any graphics card to get real-time information on what your computer is doing. First up, we have the FX8300 playing The Witcher 3. The FX8300 is now a budget processor. It is an 8-thread processor and it's overclocked to 4.2 GHz. I have a whole build series on this CPU. It's about a $600 build, or it was when I built it. You could probably put it together for even less today. Check the links in the video description below because this one, as well as the Ryzen 5 and the i7-7700K all have videos associated with them. In addition, there's a playlist down there of all the games that I've tested on these four CPUs. Some games care about the difference in the CPU, some don't. Now one of the questions that's been brought up in previous videos in this series is why am I using an RX 480 at 1080p with these four processors? Aren't we going to be graphics card limited? Yes, in many situations we are in fact graphics card limited, but that's the point. Many people who will buy a $200 graphics card such as an RX 480 or the new RX 580 which came out since I recorded these videos, same thing, a few dollars more, a little faster. A lot of people are going to buy such a card and play at 1080p and the key point is if you have such a card and if you're playing at 1080p, does it matter if you replace your processor? Do you need a new i7-7700K? Do you need the new shiny Ryzen processor? Or will a six-year-old i7-2600K or will a five-year-old FX 8000-something series processor do the job just fine? That's part of what this video was meant to show is that you don't always need the latest and greatest processor just to play games. Now, there are other reasons to upgrade your CPU besides games, productivity, uh, multitasking, just general Windows performance, modern platform support, USB 3.0 and 3.1, uh, M.2 support for modern SSDs. There are reasons to be on a newer platform besides just raw CPU speed or how well it plays a game. But this video isn't about any of that. This video is, can you play games on older CPUs just as well as newer CPUs with a reasonable graphics card and at reasonable detail and resolution? Now, I know some people would play these at 720p low detail with a 1080 Ti, and sure, there'd be a little bit more difference between the processors, but since nobody's gonna do that, I'm not going to test that. Having said that, just based upon the feedback and comments I've gotten in previous videos and what people do want to see, I will circle back around at some point and try a little bit faster graphics card on some of these. Maybe a GTX 1070, maybe a GTX 1080. I can understand why some people might put a 1070 or a 1080 into these machines and play games at 1080p. It's not necessary. All the games I've tested on these processors with an RX 480 or the new 580 or a GTX 1060 will play all current games on the market at 1080p at high detail or better at 60 frames per second or better. But there are two points to consider there. Number one, some people really do want ultra max detail on everything and these cards won't do that. Second, 
Some people play on high refresh rate monitors and they want better than 60 frames per second. So if you either want ultra max detail gaming or you want to play at 100 to 144 frames per second or at least more than 60 because you have a 100 or 144 hertz monitor, fair enough. A GTX 1080 would actually be a reasonable choice for either of those circumstances. A little bit overkill, it's not necessary. You're spending $500, at least the current price in April of 2017 when I'm filming this, you're spending $500 to play at 1080p. However, there are in fact some people who do that or they simply wanna future-proof themselves. And so I might do maybe four or five games with a more powerful graphics card simply to show what difference there might be with, for example, a $220 RX 488 gig card. So here we are on the Ryzen 5 1600X. This CPU is absolutely astounding when it comes to value for the money department. Now I've covered this in multiple videos regarding the Ryzen processors in the past. Here is my only follow-up thought. The Ryzen 5 1600 is the value or the deal among the processors. More than the 1600X, more than the 1500X. If you came to me and said, what Ryzen CPU should I buy that gives me the absolute most performance per dollar spent, then over everything else, it's the R5 1600. $220 gets you a six core, 12 thread CPU, a Wraith Spire cooler comes with it that is good enough to run at about 3.7 gigahertz fixed on all six cores out of the box, no need to buy an expensive cooler. Now here we're running at four gigahertz, but I have a hundred dollar 240 millimeter liquid cooler on this. So that's, it's not cheating, but it takes the value equation away. The 1600X is a $250 processor. Spend another hundred dollars on a fancy cooler. And even if you don't want liquid cooling, you'll still have to buy say a Noctura, um, you know, $90 big, huge, massive tower cooler or something equally impressive in order to run at four gigahertz. Ryzen 5 and Ryzen 7 at four gigahertz fixed takes basically all the cooling you can throw at it. At 3.7, maybe even 3.8, you can get away with a lot less. Now, if you don't want to use the Wraith Spire cooler, you could use something like a Cooler Master Evo 212, an excellent $30 cooler, and that will get you probably in the 3.8 possibly 3.9, it depends upon the quality of your chip. How good is the silicon that you actually have? Because each one's a bit different. But the deal is to buy the 1600 because it includes a cooler. It's $30 less expensive, so you're saving money on a cooler, you're saving money on the chip. Use the included cooler, set it to 3.7, and rock on. The difference in clock speed between 3.7 and 4.0 is more in your mind than it is in reality. To put that into perspective, it's about a 7.5% clock speed difference, but because clock speed doesn't directly translate to performance unless your CPU is the absolute limit to further performance, which it usually isn't for games. For games, it's usually your graphics card. For a game such as The Witcher 3, there would be basically zero performance difference between a Ryzen 5 at 3.7 and a Ryzen 5 at 4.0 because it's our graphics card that's preventing any further performance. Now, you would see more of a difference if I had, say, a GTX 1080 Ti in here. But let's be honest, if you've got $700 for a 1080 Ti, then the whole value equation has changed. Well, of course you should then have liquid cooling on it, and you should go for clock speed, because that's a, that's a completely different setup than going for a deal and a value equation of a more mid-range graphics card. So, my recommendation is the R5 1600. I will be doing a full build video series on that coming up very, very soon. I've got all the parts in for it now. So sometime in early May, you should see that video series start. So here we are on the i7-2600K at 4.5 gigahertz. I have to both give Intel credit and criticize them a little bit because the 2600K is an incredible CPU. Now I bought this CPU used off of eBay recently because my original uh, second gen Sandy Bridge machine was an i5 2500K and I've owned that since new. I've had that machine six years. I recently replaced the CPU. There's a video of that CPU being upgraded on my channel, by the way. I did this for benchmark purposes. I'm not suggesting you go out and get a 2600K tomorrow. Although if you find a good deal on a motherboard and chip combo, then by all means do so. I wouldn't buy it separately at this point. I would buy a working board and chip from one seller who guarantees that it works simply because 
The age of the motherboards would be my biggest concern. Um, whether or not somebody has a problem with their motherboard and they're just selling you their headache. Motherboards are the one big thing I personally don't ever want to buy used if I can get away with just because there's so much that can go wrong on a motherboard and it's so hard to test to make sure everything works. However, if you, the reason this is in here is not because I'm suggesting it, but because many people already own 2600Ks. The fact of the matter is, if your primary computer use is playing games and you own an i7-2600K, keep it. There's nothing you can replace this CPU with that is going to dramatically improve your game experience on the PC. Now it is true that this is heavily overclocked, but if you watch that upgrade video, you'll notice this doesn't have a fancy cooler on it. I'm using a $60 120mm liquid cooler. It's extremely basic. I went into the BIOS, I set it to 4.5 gigahertz, a 45 multiplier, boom, worked first time, every time, default voltages, default everything. I changed nothing but the multiplier. Look at the temperature. We're running at 53, 54 degrees Celsius at 4.5 gigahertz on a cheap $60 cooler with no issues. We're running cooler, no pun intended, on the 2600K than the 7700K. Intel is using cheap thermal interface material on their 7700Ks, and frankly, their 67 and 7700K chips are, how do I put this nicely? They've, got, they've regressed when it comes to the quality of the material they use in the integrated heat spreader for the purposes of temperatures and overclocking. There's something called delitting where some people take the integrated heat spreader apart and I am not going to do that on my channel because most people shouldn't do it because you run a real honest risk of destroying your CPU in the process and I'm not going to risk destroying my $350 CPU. Speaking of which, here we are on the 7700K. Now this is overclocked to 4.7 gigahertz. It has a very nice Corsair H80i V2 liquid cooler. Now this is a 120 millimeter liquid cooler, but it's a double fan, double thick cooler. So it provides roughly twice the cooling performance of the H60, of the, of the single fan, single thickness radiator cooler used on the 2600K. It is roughly equivalent to a 240 millimeter side-by-side -side cooler, because you've got two fans and the same amount of radiator thickness. I will at some point replace this liquid cooler with a 280 millimeter cooler and see if that makes any difference. This thing does not run nicely and very cool. Now, having just said that, if you look at the temperatures, say, what, are you crazy? Look, it's under 60, well, there's 61 degrees. Yeah, but we're using 20% of the CPU, big deal. Play Battlefield 1, and that CPU is going to be above 80 degrees Celsius. Actually use the cores. The Witcher 3 doesn't need lots of cores. The Witcher 3 is not a CPU-bound game. It's a graphics card-bound game. So when you look at the end results of this, you're going to say, gee, what did we learn here? It doesn't seem like it makes any sense. That's why I made the comments earlier about the graphics card, because I'm kind of pre-addressing comments people are going to make saying, you should have put a GTX 1080 in here. Well, yeah, but that misses the point. If you have an RX 480 and you have a five or six year old CPU running at a reasonable four gigahertz or better clock speed, and you wanna play games at 1080p such as The Witcher 3, do you need to replace your CPU? No, don't waste your money. Now replace it for other reasons. Replace it because you're playing Civilization VI. Replace it because you're doing video editing. Replace it because you're, you're doing something that needs more CPU power. This isn't it. Now, I do realize that I'm kind of telling you what the answer is before the results get here, but frankly, if you've been watching this far and you've been looking at the performance, you should already know what the results are going to be. Just watching the frame rate and watching me play through the same sequence of this game, you should be going, this doesn't really look all that different between each of these four runs. FX8300, Ryzen 5, 2600K, 7700K. That's because it isn't. Now, that's not to say there isn't any difference. Level loading speed is noticeably faster on the newer machines. And that's perhaps one of the biggest difference between a 2600K and a 7700K is it's not frame rates in the game. It's just how snappy the machine feels. But part of the snappiness of the machine comes down to the platform. The 
Z68 motherboard that the 2600K is on versus the Z270 board. The DMI 3.0, the faster PCI Express lanes, the, now I have SSDs in both machines, although I have a much better SSD in the 7700K. I have an NVMe drive, a uh, very, very good SSD, whereas I have a cheap SSD in the 2600K. But the faster RAM speed, DDR4-3200 versus DDR3-1600. No, it doesn't really affect game performance that much, but it does affect Windows performance. It affects multitasking performance. It, it does show up. There's now enough difference in RAM speed there where it does make a difference. The Ryzen 5 is a bit of an interesting machine. In terms of absolute single core performance, no, it doesn't hold a candle to the i7 machines. The clock speed's not there, but it, boy, is it smooth. It is responsive and smooth like nobody's business. I absolutely love the Ryzen machines. Okay, enough talk. Let's take a look at the results. And here we are. The green bars are the average frame rate. The blue bars are the maximum and the red bars are the minimum. If you watched one of my recent videos, which was Ghost Recon Wildlands, you'll notice that video had 1% and 0.1% lows and this one doesn't. This was actually recorded a few weeks ago before I started doing that. There's going to be a few more videos coming that still have minimum, maximum and average frame rates. In short, the issue with minimum and maximum frame rates is they're a single frame, a single point in time. It doesn't give you any kind of rolling average. 1% lows remove the bottom 1% of frames and it shows you what you'll get 99% of the time. The problem here with the red bars is while you see the FX8300 is good, take a look at the two i7s. This shows that the i7-2600K has a higher minimum frame rate than the 7700K. Well, it does in this limited test, but all that means is there was one frame somewhere in the 7700K that hit 43 for whatever reason. That kind of hiccup just happens in gaming. But if it's one frame out of 10,000 frames, who cares? It, it's a blip and you'll never notice. Now, do notice that the Ryzen 5 demonstrates what I've been saying for a long time. It's got very good minimums. Now, that's not true in every game in every situation because sometimes the CPU clock speed does matter more. But Ryzen 5 does tend to be smoother than the i7s, although the i7s are definitely faster. Average frame rate, we're completely GPU bound. Again, the point of this video is if you're running an RX 480 at 1080p, any reasonably good CPU at 4 gigahertz or better from the past six years, will give you the same 65 to 67 frames per second. You don't need a new CPU to make your game run faster. You need a new graphics card. Now, I might come back and test, as I said before, a couple of these games with a more powerful graphics card, maybe a 1080 at 1080p, to show what difference there might be. There has been requests for that. I'm pondering that. Everything takes time, so we'll see. But for this situation in an RX 480, it really doesn't matter. Please note, this is an RX 480, and RX 580 would give you essentially the same results, maybe one or two frames per second more. The RX 580 is the same basic card. The links in the video description below will be to RX 580s, not RX 480s. But if you can find a deal on a 480, keep in mind, there's less than a 5% performance difference on average between the two. So buy whichever one costs the least. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below, questions and comments in the comment section, and as always, check out the video description, that's where all the good stuff is. That is where you're going to find links to Amazon and Newegg for these graphics cards. It's where you're going to find my full playlist for the FX8300 and the i7-7700K builds and the upcoming Ryzen 5 build. You will also find links to the full playlist of tests on these four CPUs in many different games. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.